Um, I want to thank Francisco and John and Brian for the invitation to speak today. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. And I do need to say that even though I work at the National Science Foundation, anything you hear me say, it's my personal opinion. It does not refle reflect views of the National Science Foundation. Yes, I have to say that too. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is discuss the historical background of landscape genetics. I will describe some of the ways that the fields, phylogeography and landscape genetics, are thought to differ. I will also bring up a few what I consider really important major biological questions at the interface of these two fields, and actually even more broadly than that, between ecology and evolutionary biology that I think would benefit from a union of phylogeography and landscape genetics. I will provide a couple examples of recent advances that I think are particularly interesting, and then I'll end with some opportunities. So landscape genetics as a field did not start until 2003. And I'm going to say that really landscape genetics in a way preceded population genetics. And I'll t even though they didn't say that or know that, okay? from when the field was actually coined, that term. And I'm gonna take you back to Epling and Dobzhansky's work. So this is a classic paper published in 1941. It was at that time that uh, Epling, who was a systematist and botanist at UCLA, uh, friends with Dobzhansky, was at a time when Dobzhansky was very excited about finding a natural system in which to test Sewell Wright's um, shifting balance theory and the Drosophila was not working out exactly the way he wanted. And Epling, in April of 1941, was driving along the Mojave Desert and saw a very long stretch, over 200 mile stretch, of blue and white Lenanthus flowers over what seemed to be a very homogeneous um, ecological environment. Knew that Dobzhansky would be interested in this, and they established a very long collaboration on the system, which was critical to some of Wright's development of things like isolation by distance. At the time, Wright um, had not published a formal model on isolation by distance, but when Dobzhansky talked to him about this manuscript, please comment on the manuscript, Wright saw much more than just a way to look at drift, but also as a way to test isolation by distance. And then a few years later published that model, and it also was a system in which they, it was critical in the development of inbreeding coefficients and F statistics, which we still use today. And they weren't mapping genetics per se, Wright really wanted them to figure out what's the mode of inheritance of these flowers, but since they didn't know, he did it every which way, right? Blue's recessive, blue's dominant, blah, everything. Um, and so really, to me, this is the formation of population genetics and in a sense, landscape genetics. There's a landscape and there's genetics on top of it. Also another early paper by Dobzhansky and colleagues on Drosophila pseudo obscura in the Western US. These are maps of the spatial arrangement um, of, well, gene arrangements in the third chromosome of that particular species. They weren't as interested in uh, spatial differences per se, but more so in temporal differences. So those bars represent collection times. The black ones, those are flies that were collected in the 1940s. The middle stipple bar, in 1957, and the white bars in 1960 to 1965. And they were very interested in why do these patterns shift? These are just two examples. Um, there were several different arrangements. This is the standard one on the left, and I think the Chiricahua one on the right. When I look at that as a biogeographer, I say, well, look at all the, you know, the arid sort of desert um, group, and then this coastal um, Pacific Northwest coast. But that wasn't their main focus, but clearly mapping on a landscape genetic diversity patterns. And today, with all the spatial statistics that we have and GIS and spatial explicit climate data, we can really address the last sentence in that paper, which is this, the causation of the genetic changes observed 
remains problematic. I mean, they were asking questions like, well, is it insecticides? Is it, you know, why, why, are, why do we see these patterns? And we're still asking those types of questions today. So comparative phylogeography itself, to me, is not nearly as nebulous a field when it began, and that it really is um, a unique field, by my definition, is something that adds to um, the conversation, right? It's not just an amalgamation of tools and techniques from a couple different things, but it's, it's allowing us to view the natural world in a unique way, and I think phylogeography certainly did that. I'll take comparative phylogeography back to this paper, which is the same one that Brett did, Birmingham and Avis, and these are the beautiful freshwater fishes in the southeastern U.S., and in that paper, they say they want to address the role of historical biogeographic factors in shaping population genetic structure. And also another goal at the end will be to utilize genetic data to develop a regional biogeographic scenario against which other data can be used to test that. So phylogeography is not just about an interest in this particular spotted sunfish or the bowfin, but it's how can we use all of this information to understand something more about the, the historical biogeography of a region. And this is just an example of the spotted sunfish. We've seen a lot of these figures, but it's beautiful, right, where you have the organisms in these freshwater streams that drain into the Atlantic um, grouping together versus ones that um, then drain into the Gulf. And that pattern is consistent across a lot of different organisms. And what's also beautiful is that it's not just the intraspecific patterns, these also map onto species distributions, giving us insight into processes that drive diversity, lineage diversity, speciation. And as they say here, they make note of this. Remarkably, the major features of these species distributional limits summarized in that report are highly concordant with intraspecific geographic patterning. So this leads to suture zones. I think suture zones are fascinating. Um, but one of the first, this is the first sort of for uh, North America maps of suture zones was by Remington. Now, he took data from Anderson, et cetera. But it's interesting because Remington um, very much was influenced by Dobzhansky and the idea of reinforcement. So organisms being in refugia, moving out of those refugia during climate change, coming into secondary contact, right, and giving rise to reinforcement and speciation. Remington's early work, this paper in particular, was sort of uh, brushed aside by most evolutionary biologists at the time. And it wasn't for many, well, several years later that Hewitt and Europe and others came back to the suture zone idea. Um, this is a map of Remington suture zones, as he hypothesized them to be, and it wasn't just glacial refugia, but um, the colors don't matter that much, except to say that the black ones are areas that have never been reproduced by current genetic analyses. Um, Swinson and Howard, and um, my lab has done work on suture zones, and this is a paper that it was a little introduction to the overall um, work that we've done. And our work in our lab was focused on amphibians. And this is a completely new suture zone that was found by both Swinson and Howard. They have two lovely papers on that. And then in our paper, it's a major hot spot of biodiversity for lots of different organisms, all of these organisms. This yellow one is one that Remington hypothesized, but it had not been confirmed until our studies on amphibians. Um, the point of suture zones is, again, nice because it's not just hybrid zone areas. We've expanded the definition to be contact zones between sister species and phylogeographic break hotspots. So if you're a biologist interested in the processes that drive biodiversity across a landscape, these could be nice natural laboratories in which to investigate. And I'll make the point that without phylogeographic studies to uncover cryptic lineages within species, it's quite common, especially in amphibians and reptiles, we wouldn't have the power to truly understand the distribution of biodiversity at multiple levels, and then to investigate those processes. So what is modern landscape genetics? I know a lot of you in the room do landscape genetics. Um, and, I, and that's a good question. 
So I'm going to take you through some papers to put this into context. Manel et al., 2003, this is when landscape genetics was coined, um, and it was originally defined as the detection of genetic discontinuities and the correlation of those discontinuities with landscape features. And it's been said to be a bridge between landscape ecology and population genetics. So in that way, you know, sort of analogous to phylogeography being the bridge between population genetics and systematics. In that paper, they say the following, that it differs from other genetic approaches, such as phylogeography, in that it tends to focus on processes at finer spatial and temporal scales. And we'll see over and over that it's finer spatial and temporal scales. This was a review by Storfer and colleagues where they define landscape genetics as research that explicitly quantifies the effects of landscape composition, configuration, and matrix quality on gene flow and spatial genetic variation. And again, they compare it to phylogeography that can also be used to quantify genetic variation in relation to ecological processes, but at a larger spatio-temporal scale than landscape genetics, making it comparable to biogeography. And this was echoed by Ian Wong, um, Wang in his paper in Molecular Ecology. Again, it's really the temporal distinction in his mind, the difference between landscape genetics and phylogeography. And that is not as dichotomous a split now as it has been in the past. Um, and people recognize, I would say, people are doing landscape genetics, but you really need to know something about the history and phylogeography mixed together is a good thing. But I'm just trying to put this in context. And this paper by Rodney Dyer, this is an opinion paper. Actually, <laughs> I really like this paper. Um, is there such a thing as landscape genetics? So what he did, he just did some text mining stuff and said, okay, let's look at the literature and let's find out if what they say is landscape genetics, this new field, if, if it's different from population genetics and landscape ecology, right? Is it building something new? So he took a bunch of um, searches from the web um, on landscape genetics, and they had to have cited Manel. They had to have landscape genetics either in the title or in one of the keywords, and um, then used those as a pool. Also looked at population genetic studies, landscape ecology studies, and then took a random sample of 100 of, in each of those piles, right? And then um, there's a lot more to this little opinion piece than what I'm showing you here, but this is what I think the take-home message is. He did a, a discriminant analysis to, to put population genetics on one end, which is in blue here, and landscape ecology on the other end, and then said, where do these landscape genetic studies fit? And let's look at the introduction versus the methods, because, right, it could be that the theoretical context flows from population genetics, but the methods are all about landscape ecology because evolutionary biologists have found out, wow, they, can, they really have some really cool methods and they can use this GIS stuff and you know, analyze this stuff in a really unique way. And it turns out that it is a little bit different and there's you know, some uniqueness here, but 65% of the landscape genetic studies were classified as population genetics in the introduction and 78% of them were classified as population genetics from the methods. So as I said, I agree with this. this is, it's really population genetics using, I think, some tools from landscape ecology. He also says this, which is a little provocative, which I like because I like to be a little provocative as well. It appears that the field is neither unique nor uniform. It's borrowing disproportionately from population genetics and to a lesser extent landscape ecology. And there does not seem to be an indication that landscape genetics addresses questions and hypotheses that other disciplines cannot answer despite the initial suggestion that it does so. And I would say, and agree with him on this, that the further balkanization of fields is not a good thing for science because it leads to separation in thinking, in practice, um, and in you know, just training. And we need to bring this together, which is my thesis, that we need a union of comparative phylogeography and landscape genetics under this umbrella of biogeography so that we can talk um, and actually understand biodiversity on the planet. All of us, okay? So, 10 years later, after the 2003 paper came out, this review came out, and the questions changed slightly, 
So now the questions are, how has recent global change, land use and land cover, as well as climate change, affected patterns of neutral and adaptive genetic variation? And are species likely to adapt to ongoing global change on an ecological timescale? And these are pretty mission-driven questions, I think. To me, this is uh, more similar to conservation biology, sort of analogous to conservation biology, which is a field that unites ecology and evolutionary biology for particular questions relevant to today and climate change in particular, less about history. So, to summarize, the ways that phylogeography and landscape genetics are thought to differ include the following. Clearly the temporal scale, so in aqua or blue, landscape genetics um, really at the present, phylogeography, also very close but a much broader uh, temporal frame, space, Landscape genetic usually considers a small segment of a species range where phylogeography and comparative phylogeography are either looking at an entire species range or a large geographic area in which multiple species are co-distributed in some way. But it's also the methods that are very different. And some would say, you know, it's ridiculous to separate fields based on temporal and spatial um, questions. I agree with that. Clearly, Phylogeography has a phylogeny associated with it. But landscape genetics often does not. And so it's sort of devoid of history if you take it to the extreme and you're taking a map and you're gridding it off and you're asking questions about that, okay? There are a million methods in landscape genetics. Um, this is a paper by Storfer et al. looking at the percentage of total studies and several different you know, methods, and that's not even all of them. And today we know that Mantel test, really bad rap, nobody likes Mantel test or partial Mantel test anymore because of type 1 error and some other factors. Um, so there are lots of new methods that are being developed, and I think there need uh, to be new methods and new theory that link sort of organismal data, very fine scale, you know, organismal physiological data with more population level information. And so this is Gideon Bradford, who was at a Graham Coop's lab, I think, um, doing things like bedazzle. Um, and that's, they're really proud of that, I think. So it must mean something that I don't know what it means. But anyway, um, so lots of different methods. All right, so let's go back to the big picture. Um, and I really like, I like this, I like this figure for a couple different reasons. One, um, because it sort of mirrors my own educational trajectory, which, and this is um, population biology. I started out as a population community ecologist working with Henry Wilbur and was interested in spatial distributions, especially um, terrestriality and how that influenced genetic variation patterns and behavior of organisms. Added a population geneticist as a co-advisor um, who was then a fresh student out of Giannis Antonovic's lab. So really had the marriage between ecology and population genetics early, then moved over here to Berkeley to work with David Wake, a systematist, and Craig, who I'm delighted to say is in the audience, Craig Moritz, who's more of a biogeography conservation biologist. Um, and I would say you know, my own work now is much more into the biogeography. But the point is, these are real fields, right, with real histories, really strong um, disciplines and techniques and theory. But as this paper points out, with the advent of molecular markers, you blur the lines between these fields, okay? These lines have been blur blurred, and they should be. Um, this paper focuses on conservation biogeography and genetics, which I'm not going to talk about, but I've highlighted phylogeography and landscape genetics here. And then there's other things, like I don't, I've never even heard of geographical genetics and other things, you know. So these really new profound developments happen, little fields are um, butted off, and I think now it's time to go back to asking, uh, you know, back to the beginning. So in this slide, Biogeography is the field, it is the science that attempts to document and understand spatial patterns of biodiversity, okay? So there's a historical component, there's an ecological component, and what lies at the intersection, Brett may not agree with me on this, is speciation, okay? Speciation is really important. We haven't talked much about speciation in this um, symposium at all. Um, speciation is, is a really nice link with phylogeography at those two levels. 
And of course, these bridge fields in systematics, more so here, evolutionary uh, biology, population community ecology, and actually have that in without that on the other end, but we can talk about that later. So when you start adding a landscape, when you're, when you're now able to sample across an entire species range, when you're able to have that spatially explicit environmental data, it adds a whole other ball game, right? And so now, once again, we have spawning phylogeography and landscape genetics, even landscape community genetics, and, and many other things. But do new tools equal new fields? I would say new tools don't equal new fields necessarily. Um, but we do have a lot of great new tools, including georeference specimens, right? When I was at Berkeley, that was the first museum that georeferenced its entire collection. Rich Kleimans was like in the next office doing bioclim, right? It was a fantastic time to be at a place that was really involved in sort of the onset of niche modeling and, and all of this work and the importance of natural history collections. And genomics, <laughs> the rise of genomics and figuring out how do, we, how do we look at deep history and shallow history and how do we analyze these models, clearly that's a really um, big deal in systematics and, and in phylogeography and biogeography right now. And spatial statistics, um, the growth of that, and it, it, it should grow even more, you know, may produce new fields, but are they asking new questions and how are they adding to um, our knowledge? This was an interesting thing that happened several years ago. I don't, what year was it? Like 2005-ish maybe, where NSF took a bunch of people. Um, I was there, Brett was there, Ann Yoder was there, Mike Donahue was there, Catherine Graham was there. There was a lot of, maybe other people in this room. And they put us up in a mountain in, outside of Las Vegas and said, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. Um, and said, think about, you know, biogeography. And the, the reason they did that um, was because they were getting a lot of uh, proposals with the word phylogeography in it. And they, they were like, I don't know what to do with these, right, because they're sort of systematics and they're sort of evolutionary processes. And I was writing those proposals too and also really concerned about getting, you know, that, that these two fields weren't talking to each other. Um, they actually added a phylobiogeography panel for a few years. I served on it, you guys probably served on it. Um, and then it went away. And so now I'm there, and <laughs> so why did the phylobiogeography panel go away? And they will tell you that it's because phylogeography was sort of went away. That's really, you know, we didn't really have that many proposals with that, which is not, um, to me, it was the opposite. They weren't in, it wasn't in the title anymore. It just became ubiquitous, right? It was essential that you knew something about the phylogeny and the geography of your organisms if you were going to address something of consequence in evolutionary biology that had to deal with field, right, and biodiversity. So it permeated everything. Um, and there you have it. So what are some basic questions ripe for investigation in modern biogeography? Okay. I'm going to list three of those and take you through them. The biogeography of speciation is one, and I think this is really exciting because this is a paper that you probably are aware of, Kissel and Baraclau in 2010, and what they did was, you know, do this really large survey of all of these different organisms. I mean, all of these different organisms, right? There was a paper by Coyne and Price in 2000 that looked on birds across islands and said, how big of an island do you need for speciation to happen, for you to have endemic species that have given rise to, to that have split, right? And you have to have an island over 10,000 square kilometers in size. Losos and Schluter in 2000 also did an analysis on Caribbean anoles and said, what's the size where you get an island that has two organisms that probably differentiated and speciated on that island, and it's a 3,000 square kilometer island. But there wasn't a big general pattern, right? So they did this, and they looked at all these islands. Um, they quantified speciation and, um, I'll say, sympatric speciation in the geographic sense. And also from the literature looked at mean FST as a measure of gene flow. And there is a really strong relationship. If you're a snail and you don't get around very much, you can speciate on a really small island, right? And if you're a bat or a carnivore, they just did carnivores, or a moth, 
um, you don't have high FST, and you need a really large island, okay? There's not a lot of data um, and studies on this. 76% of the variation in the amount of space required for speciation across these groups was due to the average strength of gene flow. They did account for island size, for island age, <laughs> for distance. Uh, a couple recent studies that I think are very interesting, these are two islands, very, very small islands. So if you were interested in what's the spatial scale of speciation, you might say, okay, I'm gonna go to the most isolated places on the planet, and I'm gonna find out, I'm gonna do a phylogeny, I'm gonna know what the sister species are, otherwise, you can't answer this question. Um, and these isolated islands are the ones where there's not gonna be a lot of dispersal. So if you find endemic species, and, each, and you have two that are each other's, right, the sisters, then it's likely that that speciated on that island. And it turns out the Lord Howe, this is a, um, got a lot of press, Papadopoulos in 2011, Jerry Coyne wrote a little summary on this one. There are 242 species on that island of plants in 179 genera. 17 genera have two species that are endemic to Lord Howe, so they're candidates for sympatric speciation. Then they did the phylogeny, right? They looked at all these other areas to try to recreate the phylogeny of all those different um, species and then ask, you know, are there ones there that possibly speciated on that island? They came up with an, uh, a number probably closer to 4% because for some of those, you need, right, a complete phylogeny, and that's not a trivial matter. So for some groups, they didn't have... You know, they had less than 50% of the, uh, or the, the groups on that tree. For others, they had sampled them really, really well. Um, but this, this is a Lord Howe palm, and wind dispersed seeds. How could it speciate on this island that's 16 square kilometers? Um, and it could possibly do so because of magic traits, right, which I'm not going to get into. But in cases where you have a phenotypic plasticity where a seed or whatever goes on to a drier area, which causes germination to happen at a different time, that then creates gene flow separation almost instantaneously, okay? Now, on Cocos Island, a separate island off the coast of Costa Rica, a little bit larger, 24 square kilometers, 2 million years old. There are no species found that have two endemics that are sister species on that. Um, so, biogeography of speciation, if you're a student, lots of interesting questions you could ask in that. The biology of speciation, I also love this paper by Shemsky. I think Doug Shemsky is a fantastic ecologist and evolutionary biologist who published this paper, I think with his students, called The Biology of Speciation. And it was sort of in response to the growing ecological speciation is so novel, right? And he's like, when is speciation not ecological? Like never, really, really, even for polyploidy. But I mean, and we know that because like Ernst Meyer even said this, right? The majority of the factors that we have to discuss are environmental. We might therefore speak of the ecology of speciation. So it's not like this is like brand new, um, but, of course, we are looking at ecological divergence because we can now, we have better tools to do that. But it was recognized, okay? Biology of speciation is understood to have an ecological component. They have a nice figure in here with um, two organisms, very closely related organisms, the X's and the O's separated by a mountain range, and they're laying out the study design that you might use to test questions about how isolated are these groups, right? Are they isolated just in geographic space or also ecological space? So you can do niche models, and if there uh, is no over-prediction, as we say, right, for the X's into the O's habitat, then there's um, complete geographic niche model separation. But you need to do reciprocal transplants, too. Um, it actually, you know, adds a lot of power to do reciprocal transplant, take animals or plants from one area to the other and look at the fitness, okay? And that's a lot of work. But Shimsky has done a lot of this work with Mimulus, with Amy Angert, who's fantastic, at, um, up in British Columbia right now. So, we also want to contrast that with niche conservatism. And it's not one or the other again, but niche conservatism and climate 
as a mechanism driving speciation is sort of neglected in the speciation literature. And John Weens has done a lot of work on niche conservatism, both theoretical work, which is relatively recent, and also a lot of empirical work. And the theory is this. The, um, how close the dots are mean that there are more of these little animals or plants, so density is stronger, they're doing really well as climate changes. Organisms, especially um, ones on mountains or montane, right, they're moving up in general, and then they increase in density, they have higher fitness, and then it becomes to a point where physiologically they're unable to tolerate conditions down here. So this is time. And therefore, they're isolated on these mountaintops, um, not because they are in these unique uh, environmental areas, but because they cannot traverse the environmental areas here. So their niches are conserved. The failure to adapt here has isolated those. They have a nice empirical study. I like this one because we have done a lot of work um, in my lab on right eye. We've named this species Desmonathus organi after James Organ, um, who's still alive. I think he was a few years ago, I hope he is. He was very excited <laughs> when we found him and said we were naming after him. But these, uh, these salamanders are isolated on the tips of mountains in Virginia, North Carolina, in spruce fir um, habitat. And so this is the French Broad River, a major biogeographic break for lots of different organisms. And if you do niche models, so they've done this with, in green, this is Desmonathus ridei, um, sister to organi. You don't see a lot of um, overprediction, but the gray, I think both lineages could survive. Um, and they show like 16 or more examples of these montane sort of sister species um, to say, you know, can these organisms move into habitat here? Um, and in, in trying to relate this to niche conservatism as a real factor, especially in montane systems. And the theory paper is quite interesting, if you'd like to read it. There are two, um, two parameters that are really important in whether this happens or not and how fast it happens, and it has to do with the physiological lability of these organisms and also the direction of climate change. Um, so you can read that on your own. Another question, major question, uh, about species divergence and delimitation, the role of ecology and geography. And this is a major theme throughout this talk, right? Ecology and geography, um, history, et cetera. Um, this is a paper that I wrote at, as a postdoc and worked with Francois Lapointe in Montreal, where we were interested in, in California and developing methods in which we wanted to add information from groups of organisms that were very different, that had genetic information, but didn't have genetic information everywhere, right? But how do you add that information together to give us something informative about the biogeography of the area? Less interested in what's going on with the Neides lugubris, and I, I never have ended up publishing that, very sad. But <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I might be, I might be interested in the Aedes lugubris, but I wanted to add it to all of these things. And there's Petrachoceps, right? So we just use counties just to develop this method. You could, you know, split it up into different grid cells that are equally sized, et cetera. And um, then used different methods to, to test whether there was concordance, and then if there was, to build a super tree. But my excitement at the time was more about this. So when we were plotting this giant super tree and just coloring it, right, and there's no point where like here's one lineage and here's another. The super tree's not like that, right? You can go at the depth at different depths. But I happened to be working a lot on climate and niche modeling and said, that looks a lot like that. And so, <laughs> and I don't know, this is temperature, moisture. So we were able to test those. and. Um, to, to, to really look at climate again, not just vicariance, right? We've heard a lot of vicariance. Vicariance is clearly important, um, but so is adaptation and natural selection, okay? H but how fundamental, how general is ecological adaptation to speciation? Um, this paper, I thought was a great paper, a very interesting paper. It got, um, you know, some discussion about it, but it came out in 2006, and what they tried to do was they controlled for genetic, uh, for time, 
by taking genetic distance and reproductive isolation of a bunch of organisms, taking the residuals of that, and then looking at the relationship between reproductive isolation and ecological divergence. They took all the species in Coin and Ores, classic speciation text, right, and looked at habitat and diet um, and body size, and then did a bunch of pairwise analyses and tried to put this together. And they found a slight, what they would say is a positive relationship between ecology and reproductive isolation. Um, but it's, it's really an open question how general this is, and, and we have pa the power to use new methods to actually analyze ecological, you know, habitat data in a much more sophisticated um, way now. So these questions are still interesting. So let's go back to Wright and Bibjansky again, isolation by distance or geography and isolation by adaptation in ecology and landscape genetics. You see these kind of um, tests all the time. Isolation by adaptation uh, is said to look at morphological or ecological distance instead of geographic distance and look at that relationship, okay? Similar to isolation by distance in the Linanthus system. And I'm going to show you an example of a study that I think is particularly interesting by Becca Safran. She received a NSF Career Award a few years ago. She's working on this really beautiful swallow complex. It's, it's um, all over the place. And there are six subspecies in this group. And she's asking a question, does trait divergence controlling for geographic distance influence patterns of genome-wide divergence among closely related populations? And she's doing more than that, but let's just look at that. So she has a phylogeny, and it's kind of a mess, right? Um, but these barn swallows, some of them migrate huge distances. Some don't migrate at all. They have different colors um, uh, ventrally. They have different wing links and streamer links. Some traits are for sexual selection. Some traits are for natural selection. And one question here is, what are the roles of sexual selection, natural selection in shaping genome-wide patterns of divergence? So she has, you know, a lot of SNPs, uh, a lot of individuals sampled across um, the globe. And there are traits that are associated with sexual selection, like the streamer, length and ventral color, traits that are related to natural selection, like wean length, and then she also, of course, has information on features of the environment. And um, they're able to do these analyses. This is just one simple analysis looking at phenotype and geographic distance, and you see a really strong relationship, positive relationship between both of those, okay? But with methods like redundancy analysis, I think some person talked about that earlier in the symposium, you can really look at um, the strength of each of those, so sort of controlling for geography. And it turns out that most of that relationship is due to things related to natural selection, right, wing length and migratory behavior, and some of it also sexual selection, color, and distance actually falls out, geography. This paper, I actually don't have to explain it really because Lacey already did, this is her work, um, and I thought it was a great example, and she's done newer work and Anna's work also that she presented. Um, these are real advances in to understand how geography and the environment shape genetic patterns, and so it's more than just doing distance or resistance. It's, it's using information, ideally, about the biology of these organisms to, um, to figure out how natural selection and sexual selection and history work to provide biodiversity on the planet. And so as she mentioned, the first thing is just to test these correlations, right, fine, but really moving then for, uh, forward to look at the processes and taking spatially explicit demographic history into models. This particular lizard that's, you know, isolated over here in Western Australia the key is that if habitat shifts through time, so too will population sizes and migration. These things clearly influence migration or genetic patterns. And as she already showed you, if you take a model that's just isolation by distance versus current niche modeling suitability and then translating that into carrying capacity or a dynamic one that takes into account the fact that, you know, part of the land is now underwater and that those um, population sizes have shifted through time, that this one is, is much more informative. Species delimitation, I also want to make the point that these methods are being infused in systematics itself now, spatial information, more fine-scale population genetic information. This is a 
uh, an older paper by our lab, an invited paper for systematics biology, that um, we wanted to add more ecology into species delimitation. And actually, this has taken off in the last, you know, whatever, however many years ago that was. Um, and a lot of people use niche modeling in this simply as a way, in my mind, to get at how likely is there to be movement, migration, gene flow um, across contact zones. And if there's little, then um, there is more evidence to suggest that you could elevate those things to species status, if you're crazy and think about the biological species concept like I do. Okay? Um, and so we have lineages here that may or may not be elevated. We know that they're in ge separate geographic space, right? Shimsky's paper came later, but this is the same sort of thing that I talked about uh, in reference to his paper. We're modeling the niche, they don't overlap, and the contact zone, importantly, is not hospitable. And it would be nice to go out there and test that physiologically. But again, my point is that the sort of phylogeographic, spatially explicit information on the environment is useful for a lot of fields. Community assemblage and adaptation. I'm not gonna talk a lot about community assemblage. I'm gonna throw one slide up, and it's this slide, and I'm good friends with Windsor Low. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing, really? Landscape community, <laughs> community genomics and eco-evolutionary process, that's a lot of stuff to put in that title. And, um, <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I'm just throwing this out here to say, you know, uh, to me that's, it's, it's fragmenting the fields, it's fragmenting people. The good thing, on the other hand, is that there are lots of arrows, and therefore you could say, well, no, 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 these people are talking to each other, right? And so it, it is the, the unification of these groups. And if it is a true unification, great. Um, great, I don't care what you call it, but I prefer you just, you know, call it ecology or something. Okay, so, um, and it'll tell you, they'll tell you why it's distinct. Um, I'll let you read that, and if you think that's distinct, okay. So the next paper that I'm gonna go over is one that I encourage you to read because I'm not going to be able to do it justice. It's by Matt Fitzpatrick, Matthew Fitzpatrick, and Steve Keller. This is a paper also that's interesting because it's published in Ecology Letters, which I love, because it's looking, um, not because I love that journal or something, but because it's giving this sort of evolutionary genomics view and population genetic view to ecologists, okay? And Steve actually, um, is one of my academic brothers. So he, he's very, he's an incredible population genetis, geneticist. Um, this work uses methods that are based in community modeling, okay, community modeling of species, and conferring, uh, constructing those into ways to analyze SNP data, millions of SNPs across a landscape in a spatially explicit way, in a multivariate way, with non-linear sort of dynamics, okay? So we suggest, they suggest that community level modeling of turnover in allele frequencies along environmental gradients offers a powerful but largely unexplored means of scaling from individual or population level genomic variation to landscape scale predictions. And when applied, it can accommodate pronounced non-linearities in the exploration of gene environment interactions or relationships. It can handle large genomic data sets with low frequency alleles. It provides insights into the portion of the genome that's under selection. And it can also generate maps um, of how adaptive genomic diversity is gonna change and vary um, across a landscape through time. And they use the balsam poplar because there's a ton of data on that and, and they um, developed much of it. Had 400 anonymous SNPs. Um, they also had candidate genes that were likely under selection. And they also looked at some in which, especially GI5, the Gigantia 5, which has a strong signal of gene environment interaction, which is characteristic of local adaptation. And they can plot all these cumulative importance um, figures across many different um, environmental variables, like mean summer temperature. And the beauty of this is, here's another way to look at it. These are 750 SNPs, and the ones in red are uh, SNPs within the GI5 gene. And um, you can figure out which SNPs show strong turnover, 
you can find which environmental predictors are most important for accounting for the correlations and where along this gradient the turnover actually happens, I mean, between 12 and 14 degrees. Then he's able to um, convert that into spatially explicit maps of local adaptation and environment. So he has phylogeographic lineages, so there's history, phylogeography in there, and also a lot of landscape genomics here. Whether, and so this is sort of a summary. Rather than assembling and predicting numerous species within communities, they're assembling and predicting SNP um, within a genome. So instead of a site by species matrix, they have a site by SNP matrix, and then they're relating that to environmental data. And this is a map of the reference SNPs, the GI5, and the difference between those. And to get the detail on how they did that, you're going to have to read the paper. But they also make the case, and I talked to Steve because I said I, I really would like to present this as a, a really nice example of current advances in landscape genetics. Um, the ability to forecast areas that are likely to show differences, and in this case, these are sort of offsets or hot spots of genetic maladaptation. This is using 2050's climate. Um, and they just highlight two areas. One area where they would predict uh, a big genetic maladaptation, so it's red, it's very different in the future from now to here, and it goes up. Okay. So biogeography itself is a science that attempts to document and, and understand spatial patterns of biodiversity, and speciation is in the middle there, and there are lots of interesting questions that still need to be addressed. Okay, so if you want funding, for example, Go Live is really interesting. You might not be aware of it. You still have a couple months to submit. Um, and it's to resolve the phylogenetic history of all life's diverse forms and to integrate this with organismal and environmental data. There are ways to fund biogeography, not just in biology, but in geosciences as well as the social and behavioral and environmental sciences. And I would encourage you to look at all the different sort of databases that exist, including morphology and environmental data. And then if you think NEON might help, you know, this is an environmental continental scale um, <laughs> multi-year program to get flux data, which may be important. So there's a lot of exciting questions. Um, that still remain at the union of comparative phylogeography and landscape genetics, including how much reduction of gene flow, if any, is required to generate new species, and is that gene flow most often reduced by genetic distance or natural selection or other factors? Why do species have range limits in the absence of geographic barriers? Can we predict species responses to climate change, including adaptation and phenotypic plasticity? How might species in a community differ and thus influence these different dynamics? And what's the relative role of contemporary versus con um, historical processes on genetic diversity patterns of species? So, to me, in the two minutes I have left, <laughs> okay, one and a half, um, this actually is um, sort of analogous to what DEB looks like, if you know the Division of Environmental Biology, except there's this thing here called Biogeography and Evolutionary Ecology. Right now, Evolutionary genetics and evolutionary gen um, ecology genetics are together. But biogeography, I just want to make the point, is really at the union of ecology and evolution. And there are a lot of questions, including comparative phylogeography and landscape genetics one, species range dynamics and others, that fall at that interface. And it doesn't make sense to balkanize the field, which creates disconnect between people and thinking, um, that we should come together again and really teach the next generation that a more synthetic and integrative approach can give us insight into answering some of the most fundamental questions in biology today. Thank you.